I am Nancy Ruther, Associate Director of the Macmillan Center, which is the happy home of the happy owner, uh, steward of Loose Hall, which is where you're sitting. And we are the Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. So we look after keeping the rest of the world and crucial international global issues in the curriculum and in the faculty and students' minds, most importantly. So one of the ways we like to work on keeping international issues very much alive in educational circles is through our wonderful peer team, the programs in international education and resources. And I actually have the good fortune of managing that team, which is very easy because they do it all and I get to applaud events like this that they organize. And I guess they were in touch with Judy Freeman from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum who, and they started cooking up the idea for this conference for educators to address this awful and awfully important topic of genocide in the 20th and the 21st centuries. So we owe a great debt of gratitude to Judy Freeman and the memorial for a great deal of the funding and effort to organize this event, along with our own faculty experts, other invited experts, and our own peer team. But I think, from what I can tell, they have a great setup to help ensure maximum learning in a very short time. As I understand it, this uh, technique they're going to use Verbal grupa is kind of like the Evelyn Woods speed reading method assigned to adult education. It worked very well last summer with a number of groups, so I suspect you will learn more than you ever imagined in a very short time through this method, at least I hope so. And we hope very much that you can take this back to your own students and colleagues because this topic, genocide, comes in so many lovely guises, so easy to ignore as evil, as the underlying evil that comes in this nicely painted face all too often. So I wish you all the best in trying to uncover, decode, decipher, address, understand the terrors and the wonders that get involved in these unfortunately global phenomenon. So great thanks to those that have put it together. Even greater thanks to those of you who will take the lessons home to your students and hopefully prevent or diminish the prospects for future genocides. So with that, I turn it over to my good colleague, Max Amo, to introduce the important people, the speakers for the evening. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and we have a wonderful personality to kick this whole thing off. In the person of Ben Cannon, who is the Whitney Griswold Professor of History, Professor of International and Area Studies, and Director of the Genocide Studies Program here at Yale University. Uh, he's the author and co-author of a shelf full of books, uh, of which I will mention just a few. Uh, Blood and Soil, a world history of genocide and extermination from Sparta to Darfur. And that was published in 2007. And then there is Genocide and Resistance in Southeast Asia, Documentation, Denial, and Justice in Cambodia and East Timor also published 2007. And then I'll mention this last one, how Pol Pot came to power, colonialism, nationalism, and communism in Cambodia from 1930 to 1975. And this was published in 1985 and republished in 2004. 
Ben is a member of the editorial boards of Critical Asian Studies, Human Rights Review, Genocide Studies and Prevention, and the Journal of Genocide Research. He was founding director of the Cambodian Genocide Program here at Yale from 1994 to 1999, and convener of the Yale East Timor Project from 2000 to 2002. Uh, Professor Kiernan's edited collection, Conflict and Change in Cambodia, won the Critical Asian Studies Prize for 2002 and was republished as a book in 2006. He is also the editor of Genocide and Democracy in Cambodia, the Herma Roach, the United Nations, and the International Community, 1993, uh, and co-editor of Revolution and its Aftermath in Kampuchea, 1983, and the specter of genocide, mass murder in historical perspective, 2003. Uh, with this background, please join me to welcome Professor Kenan. <laughs> Thank you, Max. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'd also like to thank uh, Nancy Ruther and also Brian Carter and Judy Freeman of the Holocaust Memorial Museum. The 1948 United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide defines that crime as, quote, acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, racial, ethnical, or religious group as such. And these acts include killing members of the group, but also deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Now, tonight my goal is threefold. To describe, firstly, some of the genocides in world history that meet this definition. Second, to describe some of their common recurring themes that are missing from the legal definition I just gave you. And third, to illustrate some of the new resources available to students and teachers for teaching about genocide. The Genocide Convention of 1948 focuses on crimes against national, racial, ethnical, or religious groups. And that correctly makes clear that racial or religious hatred is an integral part of genocide. Along with that, though, I want to draw attention to three lesser known features that usually accompany genocide. And these are expansionism, agrarianism, and cults of antiquity. Like racial hatred, expansionism, agrarianism, and cults of antiquity are common obsessions of genocidists which can be detected in advance. Genocidal thinking is usually and recognizably racist, rural, archaic, and expansionist. Now we see here Charlie Chaplin's uh, movie, The Great Dictator, a poster for that movie which illustrates Hitler's desire to conquer the globe. And along with Nazi hatred of Jews, the expansion of Hitler's regime is fairly well known. Cults of agrarianism are lesser known as a common feature of the genocidal mentality. This photograph of Heinrich Himmler was taken by his niece in 1935. Here we see Hitler's number two, the architect of the final solution, rurally decked out in traditional German lederhosen, all set to be photographed in a field near his home in Bavaria. And cults of antiquity along with expansionism and racial hatred and agrarian ideology, cults of antiquity are a fourth feature of this mindset. Genocidal ideology usually seeks precedence and validation in the past. Hitler praised Arminius, Hermann, who annihilated ancient Roman legions as the first architect of our liberty. When he urged in 1924, that the new Reich, quote, must again set itself on the march along the road of the Teutonic Knights of old, 
to obtain by the German sword, sod for the German plough, Hitler combined antiquity with both aggression and agrarianism. He considered Roman history the best mentor probably for all time. He praised Rome's genocide of Carthage in 146 BC as the execution of a people through its own deserts. The Nazis also turned to classical Sparta as an ancient model. Hitler recommended that a state should limit the number allowed to live and he praised the Spartans for being capable of such a wise measure of exposing sickly children to the elements to die. I've just learnt, Hitler further remarked, that the feeding of the Roman armies was almost entirely based on cereals, he said just after invading the Ukraine and the Soviet Union. Now, he added, they will one day be the granaries of Europe, but only with German agricultural settlement. The Slavs are a mass of born slaves, he said, claiming that under the German peasant, every inch of ground is zealously exploited. Nothing is lovelier than horticulture. Germans were more advanced, he said, because our ancestors were all peasants. He considered a healthy peasant class, quote, a foundation for a whole nation. A solid stock of small and middle peasants has been at all times the best protection against social evils. Nazis saw Jews not just as a subhuman race in their ideology, but also as anti-peasants, the archetypal town dwellers. Anti-urban thinking reinforced the virulent anti-Semitism. While we lacked a legal definition of genocide until the 1940s, it goes back at least as far as the classical era. This is a 13th century French medieval depiction of the Roman genocide of Carthage in 146 BC. The instigator of that was Cato the Elder, who was famous as perhaps the first, uh, the author of the first recorded incitement to genocide, Carthage must be destroyed, Delenda est Carthago. But he was not just a territorial expansionist and anti-feminist censor, he was Cato the, Cens Cato the censor, but he was also an agrarianist determined to protect ancient Roman rural values against mercantile threats like Carthage. It is true that to obtain money by trade is sometimes more profitable were it not so hazardous, he wrote, and likewise money lending if it were as honourable. Our ancestors held this view. Their praise took this form, good farmer and good settler. One so praised was thought to have received the greatest commendation. Cato wrote in his book on agriculture. It is from the farming class, he went on, that the bravest men and the sturdiest soldiers come. Their calling is most highly respected. Medieval thinking about war was less genocidal. Uh, this medieval depiction of the fall of Carthage looks more like a medieval siege than a classical genocide. But medieval Look, look, the medieval look backwards changed dramatically in early modern Europe. First with the Renaissance rediscovery of classical texts providing much more horrendous descriptions of what had happened to Carthage. And second with the onset of European expansion and imperialism. At the beginning of the world, said a Portuguese Jesuit in 1559, all was homicide. It was in the 16th century that many Europeans began looking to ancient precedents, even for genocide, a phenomenon that became more frequent with European expansion in 1492 and afterwards. In post-medieval early modern culture, the story of Carthage now became much better known and more homicidally depicted. Just to contrast, this is a 17th century depiction of a biblical genocide uh, of Joshua against the Amorites. Very different and more blood-curdling uh, depiction than in medieval periods. At the same time, European and imperial and territorial conquests of most of the globe involve pastoral or agrarian romanticism, as well as both genocide and anti-Semitism, supposedly justified by classical and biblical antiquity. <clears throat> 
conquerors turned to ancient genocides for precedence. When the Spanish built their empire in the New World, they looked to Rome's expansion to justify their own. Estimates of the native population of the island of Hispaniola, distributed among these five kingdoms in 1492, ranged from 500,000 or so. By 1514, just 32,000 Indians survived. Over 90% of the islanders perished in 22 years. Also, a similar uh, catastrophe was the result in Mexico of Cortes' uh, conquest there in the early 16th century. And uh, this is scenes of that barbarity depicted by the victims later in the 16th century. As the, Eng as the early modern English sought their own conquests, they self-consciously took on the mantle of Roman imperialism to justify their expansion. In 1570 and 71, a group of Elizabethan gentlemen met frequently in London to discuss classical Roman military strategy at the home of Sir Thomas Smith. The Smiths and their associate, Gabriel Harvey, used classical texts as handbooks for colonizing Ulster in Ireland. Another participant in these classical discussions was Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who had spent years fighting in Ireland, and he also wrote in admiration of ancient Rome's supremacy. He even shared Cato's rage against domestic and cultural threats, as well as foreign enemies. These Elizabethan knights saw Ireland as Cato had Carthage. And here is one of them, another member of this circle, who left for Ireland in 1580, Sir Arthur Gray de Wilton, along with Edmund Spencer, the famous writer, the poet. Spencer wrote a Latin poem calling Gabriel Harvey the great Cato of our era. Harvey wrote back that your great Catos and our little Catos make such a buzzing and ringing in my head. Spencer was in Ireland with Gray in November 1580 when Sir Arthur Gray de Wilton, depicted on the right here, ordered his troops to carry out the massacre of 600 disarmed, surrendered papal troops. Gray reported to Elizabeth I, I put in certain bands who straight fell to execution. There were 600 slain. And this sketch is a woodcut from a 1581 pamphlet, which asserted that the papal troops had received their just deserts, incited by a blasphemous anti-Christian prelate, the Pope. Potent as they were, classical precedent and religious bigotry were not the sole justifications for the English slaughter in Ireland. Contributing to growing ethnic animosity was the view of many English settlers that the Irish were poor farmers. They couldn't cultivate the land. Colonial propagandists described Ireland as uncultivated or even uninhabited because it wasn't cultivated. One advised colonists to bring seed and implements as if they should imagine to find nothing here but earth and indeed little else shall they find. A different kind of agrarian fetish was evident across the world a decade later during Japan's invasions of Korea in the 1590s. This is a uh, painting of Kyoto early in the 17th century, not long afterwards. Kill Koreans one by one and empty the country were the, was the order of the Japanese ruler Hideyoshi. He urged his forces to punish the Koreans without leaving a thing behind. He rewarded his soldiers for each Korean they put out of action, documented by their presentation of the severed noses of their victims. The noses were then sent pickled in barrels to Kyoto, where Hideyoshi built this mound in the center right there, the green mound with the monument on the top, uh, is known as the Mimizuka, or ear mound, uh, supposedly containing the buried ears and noses of the victims. Ears were not their only contents. A Japanese general's war memoirs testified to the burial of 185,000 Korean and 29,000 Chinese heads. Along with this external expansionism aimed at the conquest of China as well as Korea, Hideyoshi's domestic policy was decidedly agrarian. Japanese farmers had to remain in their place as a subservient peasantry. 
Otherwise, the fields would not be cultivated, Hideyoshi feared. His policy ensured that, quote, the farmers will be saved in this life, needless to say, and in the life to come. Should any farmer abandoning his fields go into trade or wage labour, that person, needless to say, and all in his village shall be brought to judgment. Back in the Atlantic, England's conquest of Ireland had set a precedent for North America. When Humphrey Gilbert went down with his ship in the Atlantic in 1583, his half-brother, Sir Walter Raleigh, took his place. Our land is full, their land is empty, one colonist wrote of the Indians in 1622. They are few and do but run over the grass, as do also the foxes and the wild beasts. In this view, Indians whose corn fed the newcomers in Massachusetts supposedly had no faculty to use either the land or the commodities of it. So it is lawful now to take a land which none useth. But Native Americans contested the seizure of their land and after clashes in 1637 here in Connecticut, Massachusetts declared war on the Pequot Indians. Settlers in Hartford also declared an offensive war. Boston branded the Pequots and all other Indians as a common enemy. They surrounded the Pequot village at West Mystic and uh, in an hour and something, just over one hour, uh, burned to death the entire population inside, uh, about 600 or 700 Pequot Indians and their families. Uh, this is a sketch from 1638 by one of the participants, John Underhill, uh, which shows uh, 98 lodges all on fire. The English lost two dead in, uh, in this attack. Thus was God seen, John Mason, the leader, added, burning them up in the fire of his wrath and dunging the ground with their flesh. In other words, manuring the ground, emphasizing, again, the connection between genocide and the fetish of cultivation. The Indian allies of the English, who were in the outer ring, as you can see with the uh, English forces on the inside in the, uh, surrounding the fort, the Indian allies who were Narragansetts thought that this fighting method was too furious and slays too many men, they said. John Underhill wrestled with the implications of the massacre. It may be demanded, why should you be so furious, as some have said? Should not Christians have more mercy and compassion? But he answered by appealing to ancient biblical precedent. I would refer you to David's war, he wrote. Sometimes the scripture declareth women and children must perish with their parents. We had sufficient light from the word of God for our proceedings. Here's a portrait of the site in 1879 on the hill above the Mystic River, still empty. Colonial massacres of indigenous peoples were numerous, sometimes genocidal. This map shows just a few selected cases. One of the major developments of world history is the very rapid occupation by European settlers of two almost entire continents, North America and Australia, in the 19th century. The extermination of the Tasmanian Aborigines, all 4,000 of whom died during British settlement in the 19th century, is well known, but their tribal names, shown on this 1998 map, are rarely mentioned. Yet Tasmania was no exception. Around 1800, the Australian mainland itself was home to over 700 Aboriginal communities, each with its own language. Over the next century, most of these ethnic groups and their languages also disappeared in the violent conquest of the continent. In 1886, an Australian artist depicted the fate of Aborigines this way. The two top sketches are inaccurate, in fact. Whites didn't disembark shooting from their ships, nor did Aborigines spear missionaries. But whites did often kill Aborigines to protect their investment in pastoral stock, mostly sheep. Many more blacks died of diseases or hunger as their native game, the kangaroos, retreated at the advance of white farmers. In both Tasmania and the mainland, white settlers argued that the native peoples did not cultivate the land and therefore could not own it. 
even whites who did recognise Aborigines as owners of the land, could hardly imagine them actually occupying it. Here is a map drawn by the founder of Melbourne in Australia in 1835, John Batman, showing land that he considered he'd bought from Aborigines. It's entitled, Attractive Countries Ceded by the Native Chiefs of Southern Australia to John Batman. The chiefs are unnamed and their people appear nowhere on the map, which is largely empty, except, perhaps you can read, for descriptions of its emptiness. The word open appears on it six times, combined four times with extensive. Extensive open plains as far as the eye can reach to the westwards, open and extensive country, and so on. Now, if John Batman could have seen or imagined more Aborigines or recognised their land use, the open plains across what became the state of Victoria might have looked more like this. I just want to draw attention to the Kurnai people of Gippsland, uh, that region of Victoria in the uh, eastern part of the map. Instead, by 1858, Batman's map of the Melbourne area resembled this a solid grid of settlement uh, displacing Aboriginal occupants. The Kurnai region was now called Gippsland in this 1858 map, just 23 years after Batman's Treaty of 1835. In less than a quarter of a century, the 2,000 or more Kurnai people had almost disappeared from hunger, disease and massacres. Their homes had acquired classical names like the Acheron River and the Rubicon. It took another 30 years to retrospectively map the five Kurnai tribes and clans and their neighbouring uh, Aboriginal tribe. The same era saw another catastrophe in California, which might have looked something like this at the onset of US rule in 1846. From then until 1874 in Northern California, Federal troops, state government and local militias and bounty hunters all conducted repeated massacres of Indian populations, including some on this map, for instance, the Yuki and Tolowa. Many linguistic groups vanished. The San Francisco Bulletin commented in 1860, even the record of Spanish butcheries in Mexico and Peru has nothing so, so diabolical. In the destruction of Indians elsewhere, a pastoral romance accentuated this pervasive agrarianism along with the exigencies of conquest. General George Armstrong Custer is shown uh, in this map somewhere. That's his wagon train going through the Black Hills of Dakota in 1874. Custer found there what the New York Tribune called an Eden in the sky without the forbidden fruit. This photograph by William Illingworth shows uh, Paradise in July 1874. Custer wrote, every step of our march that day was amidst flowers of the most exquisite colours and perfume. So luxuriant in growth were they that men plucked them without dismantling from the saddle. It was a strange sight to glance back at the advancing columns of cavalry and behold the men with beautiful bouquets in their hands while the headgear of their horses was decorated with wreaths of flowers fit to crown a queen of May. Custer added, the soil is that of a rich garden. Nature has done so much to prepare homes for husbandmen. The New York world proclaimed an agricultural and pastoral paradise. A Chicago reporter wrote that the Indian will never make any use of the rich soil that has been waiting centuries to be utilized. So it would not be robbing him to deprive him of it. Accompanying this agrarian and pastoral romance was the model from antiquity. The New York Tribune's reporter wondered, did Julius Caesar have such a wagon train? As the soldiers pitched camp, the, he reported, they asked their commander how many miles today, just as Xenophon was asked. Ultimately, the conquest of the North American continent became a triumph of civilization over pastoralists and its art reflected that grandeur. Here we see an eclectic combination of the classical, the national, the indigenous, and the pastoral in the Philadelphia's uh, Washington Monument. Despite two millennia of genocides, many people think of that crime as a 20th century phenomenon. 
This is in part because new technology and communications now made genocide even more efficient and mechanised. The first non-colonial genocide of the 20th century was the Armenian catastrophe at the hands of the Young Turks regime of the Ottoman Empire during World War I. It started in early 1915 when hundreds of Armenians were rounded up and hanged in the streets of Constantinople before beginning the genocidal deportation of the Armenians to the desert in which perhaps a million died or were murdered en route. In turn, the Armenian case became a model for other genocides of the 20th century. After all, its perpetrators had got away with mass murder. Who today speaks of the Armenians? Hitler asked in 1939. This was the era of the rise and fall of fascism and communism. For new totalitarian party states propounding scientific race or class ideologies, entire groups became inimical or expendable. The communist giants, Stalin's USSR and Mao's China, pursued mass killing of domestic political enemies and social classes. They were a bit less preoccupied with racial categories or territorial expansionism and not at all with historical antiquity. Stalin, unlike Mao, harbored no hint of agrarian idealism either. But despite these important exceptions, the major themes of previous eras, racial and religious hatreds, fetishes with history and agriculture, and territorial expansionism, persisted in most of the cases in what has been called the century of genocide just past. This photograph shows Adolf Hitler on the right and Hermann Goering on the left at Hitler's mountain home, Haus Wackenfeld, in the Bavarian Alps. Ignatius Feyre published this photo in Homes and Gardens, November 1938. He described what he called this, quote, sunny subalpine home hundreds of miles from Berlin's uproar, set amid an unsophisticated peasantry of carvers and hunters. Of the squire of Wackenfeld, Hitler wrote, uh, Feyre wrote, it is over 12 years since Herr Hitler fixed on the site of his one and only home. Here in the early days, Hitler's widowed sister kept house for him on a peasant scale. Sometimes when state affairs are over, the squire himself, attended by some of his guests, will stroll through the woods into the hamlets above and below. There, rustics sit at cottage doors, carving trinkets and toys in wood, ivory and bone. Frauen Goebbels and Goering in dainty Bavarian dress arrange dances and folk songs. Here is Himmler in the fall of 1942 inspecting cotton fields in Ukraine. The results of this agrarian and racial Nazi ideology in action are well known. A Jewish prisoner in Auschwitz photographed with her head held in a bracket an open mass grave with thousands of Jews in Ukraine, 1942. A Nazi propaganda poster in Ukraine. The collective farm system has come to an end. Every hardworking peasant will get land of his own. Of course, this isn't what happened, but it was an integral part of Nazi propaganda. So was this. This is a, the cover of an SS magazine, February 1942. Volk und Rasse, uh, race and people, people and race idealizing a German farmer in Ukraine. Across the other side of the world, the Japanese were expanding into China, and this is a 1938 uh, pro-Japanese cartoon emphasizing the destruction of biological pests, that is, the communists and the Chinese warlords in, uh, at the hands of uh, the Japanese who uh, represented the rising east. Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia during the late 1970s combined Stalinist communism with racism and agrarian idealism and also a cult of antiquity, but not of Rome. This is uh, Angkor Wat, center of the medieval Khmer Empire, built between 1080 and 1150. Pol Pot called himself the original Khmer and spun a national narrative of Cambodia's lost glory since the era of Angkor. In that story, the Khmer nation had lost lands, lost to encroachments on uh, Cambodia by Vietnamese from the east, 
and tyres from the West. This is a satellite image of Cambodia. This is a Cambodian identity card of a Vietnamese resident of Cambodia in the 1950s. Cambodia did not grant citizenship to its ethnic Vietnamese minority, and they and other minorities suffered genocide under Pol Pot's regime in the late 1970s. Uh, one of even Cambodians of the majority, Khmer group, uh, were often targeted with the label Khmer bodies with Vietnamese minds. The mid in the mid-1960s, uh, and particularly from 1970, the Vietnam War had spilled over into Cambodia, and the forces of Pol Pot and the xenophobic Khmer Rouge communists whom he led grew under US bombardment. These are the sites that were bombed. About 2.7 million tons of US bombs were dropped on Cambodia between 1965 and 73. And in that period, particularly at the height of the bombing from 1970 to 1973, the Khmer Rouge forces grew from 5,000 to over 200,000, largely because of uh, re their ability to recruit uh, because of peasant resentment at the destruction and death wrought by the bombing. The Khmer Rouge leaders envisaged an agrarian society free of urban contaminations. When they took the capital, in April 1975, they immediately evacuated its two million residents into the countryside, blew up the National Bank. This is the photo I took in 1975. Uh, this is the photo I took in 1980. It still hadn't been repaired uh, five years later. They also abolished money and launched attacks into communist Vietnam. And four years later, 1.7 million Cambodians had died, a fifth of the population. Meanwhile, in 1976, the Khmer Rouge turned a Phnom Penh High School into S21, the secret central prison and extermination center. This is a, a 1980 photograph of mine as well. At S21, the Khmer Rouge jailers photographed 4,000 prisoners and killed 14,000. Only seven survived in 1979 when the regime fell to a retaliatory Vietnamese invasion. Here is another prisoner of the Khmer Rouge, photographed with his head held in a bracket, recalling the Jewish prisoner of the Nazis we saw earlier. This is the uh, excavation of the graves of the prisoners in September 1980. The site is now a memorial with skulls stored behind glass walls in a Buddhist stupa. These are memorials to the victims in Vietnam of Khmer Rouge cross-border raids in which uh, tens of thousands of Vietnamese uh, farmers, uh, some of them ethnic Cambodians, most of them ethnic Vietnamese, were slaughtered by Khmer Rouge forces crossing the border. There's another memorial in Vietnam to a massacre on March 14, 19. 78. A 1978 Vietnamese cartoon takes up the issue of antiquity as well. This shows the ancient Chinese emperor, Qin Zhi Huang Di, who was famous for burning the books. And you can see the Great Wall of China in the background uh, and, and uh, was also famous as a, a very repressive ruler. He's telling the Khmer Rouge, you are doing a very good job following my example, uh, piling up skulls and burning books as well. Not long ago, a Thai actress was reported in Cambodia claiming that Angkor Wat belonged to Thailand. She denies saying any such thing. Uh, but Thais have occasionally said that in the past, and this provoked a, a very violent reaction in Cambodia in which Thai businesses and hotels were trashed and even the Thai embassy. Meanwhile, across uh, the South China Sea and East Timor, Indonesia invaded that territory. This is a picture, photographs taken just before the Indonesian invasion of East Timor in 1975. Half of the island was already part of Indonesia, uh, <clears throat> and the Indonesians expanded into East Timor, uh, but were unable to crush East Timorese resistance uh, 
for a, during a 24-year occupation until the UN held a plebiscite on independence. Uh, and this satellite photograph was taken uh, a couple of weeks later, not long after the vote was announced by the UN that 79% of Timorese had voted for independence from Indonesia. The Indonesian troops responded by burning down 80% of the buildings in the country and killing more than 1,000 people. And the satellite went over on September 8th, 1999. Uh, you can see that small island towards the top. If you look down from there south towards the coast, uh, you'll see uh, uh, this particular area, the capital of Dili. And if you zoom in, the high resolution satellite image actually shows the black plumes of smoke pouring out of the city of Dili, which had been set on fire by the retreating uh, Indonesians. Meanwhile, in the 1980s, another military dictatorship in Guatemala conducted a counterinsurgency genocide of Mayan Indian groups. In an age-old theme, the Guatemalan regime urged survivors to become new farmers. We have a satellite image of part of the uh, homeland of the Mayan Indian groups in, uh, majority in Guatemala, the Ishil Triangle. Uh, this was uh, work done by Russell Schimmer, who's here tonight, and Adam Jones as well. Uh, and it shows the deforestation of an area where uh, Mayan groups were subjected to genocide, scorched earth tactics. The red splotches that you can see there surrounding the Ishil Triangle represent uh, areas deforested between 1979 and 1986, the, covering the height of the genocide from 81 to 83. The Rwandan genocide in 1994 came complete with its own cult of racism and antiquity. This is an ID card that Tutsis were forced to carry in Rwanda uh, from the 1950s or nine, since the 1930s, but these were used to round up Tutsis uh, during the 1994 genocide. One of the people now serving a jail term for genocide is a historian named Ferdinand Nahimana. Uh, that's him there on the left. But he drew this map in 1983 of the ancient kingdoms of Rwanda. He saw these Hutu principalities in the northwest of Rwanda as the real pure Rwanda before the interloping Tutsis arrived, supposedly from Abyssinia in the 16th century. Before that, Hutu ideologues claimed that the uh, Hutu people and uh, other ethnic groups were living peacefully as farmers uh, and it was only the disruption of Rwanda by arrival of Tutsi uh, immigrants uh, in uh, early modern times that was the cause of uh, ethnic conflict in Rwanda. Here is a satellite image of post-genocide Rwanda. The blue dots represent mass graves from the 1994 genocide. The red dots represent memorials to the victims. And the green dots represent sites of resistance, particularly over in the west near Lake Kivu, uh, near a place called Bisacero Hill, where uh, some Tutsi uh, victims held out in the forest uh, in resistance against the Hutu power uh, killers. Uh, you can see that on the left near the lake, this is just zeroing in. Again, the red splotches represent areas where there has been uh, vegetation uh, removed. And if we zoom in a bit closer again, uh, those two green circles represent sites of resistance from the map I showed you earlier. Uh, and you can see the red uh, pixels and splotches showing uh, deforestation where the victims were chased down uh, by the scorched earth tactics of the killers uh, cutting down the trees in order to uh, destroy the resistance or the uh, uh, people taking shelter in, in the forest. Unfortunately, even though uh, the United Nations in 2004, on the 10th anniversary, uh, uh, apologized to the Rwandan people and uh, hoped to do better, uh, and also President Clinton made a similar apology uh, 
as well, uh, at this very 10th anniversary uh, ceremony, uh, the genocide in Darfur had already begun. This is a 2004 uh, image of destruction in one part of Darfur. Here is a more recent image uh, of a place on the right uh, identified by the US uh, Holocaust Memorial regime's uh, excellent report called Crisis in Darfur, uh, not far away from a completely undamaged uh, village compound. But I want to show uh, a more general picture of West Darfur, uh, which is the result of more work done by Russell Schimmer very recently. And I've just uh, uh, wanted to share this with you uh, because it will be on the website of the Genocide Studies Program. It may be useful for students uh, to use some of this material. But this shows change in vegetation after the beginning of the outbreak of the genocide in Darfur in 2003, uh, where, it, uh, it, where it really began. By the time of the next year, you can see there are large splotches of blue, which suggest a decrease in vegetation, which is probably a result of the people being killed or driven out and uh, the land not being cultivated. But over time, we get a different feature, also a result of the people being killed or driven out, uh, which is an increase a bit later in vegetation because the livestock have also been driven out and the wild plants are coming back and the biomass is now going uh, in, uh, increasing enormously. And so from the initial decrease, uh, we have a, an, an enormous increase in the amount of uh, vegetation, but it's mostly a result of both the people and the animals uh, being emptied. And of course, you can correlate that with the centers of destruction of the uh, militias who have destroyed so many of the villages and stolen so much of the livestock uh, of the people of Darfur. So four telltale characteristics of genocide have recurred regularly since the 15th century at least, uh, and even in ancient times. The preoccupation of perpetrators with race, antiquity, agriculture, and expansion. The early modern rediscovery of Rome's destruction of Carthage provoked repeated comparisons with indigenous victims of contemporary cases. In colonial Ireland and Mexico, commentators speculated that the hapless indigenes were actually descended from surviving Carthaginians dispersed across the world. A British official in the Scottish Highlands in 1692 wrote about the MacDonald clan, Delenda est Carthago, Carthage must be destroyed, quoting Cato directly. As expansionism escalated, the myth of an untouched empty land usually played a key role in spurring the displacement and destruction of its actual inhabitants. So did the settler fetish for cultivation of the land. Agricultural metaphors easily expressed mass murder of target groups. A Spanish settler in 16th century Mexico talked of using Indian blood to irrigate his fields. While British and German settlers in Australia threatened to use the bodies of Aborigines for fertilizer. The Khmer Rouge administered that very fate, they actually did that, to Cambodian city dwellers. Even as urbanization spread over the globe in the 20th century, a violent form of agrarianism still flourished through its final decades. From Eastern Europe to Southeast Asia, from Central America to Central Africa, genocidal regimes across the political spectrum that massacred ethnic enemies also sponsored agriculturalists and settlers employing the same terms in the variety of vocabularies. It's amazing to track the genocidal regimes of various different political hues uh, using the same term model farmers in their different languages to describe uh, what was necessary to replace uh, victims. Fetishes of biological purity and contamination have also strengthened the racism and violence that promote genocide. In Ireland in 1580, Lord Arthur Gray de Wilton, whom you saw before, informed Queen Elizabeth that Catholicism was a disease, a canker, never receiving cure without corrosive medicines. In 1641, another English commander, Sir Charles Coote, justified his order to kill not only Irish men and women, but also children more than a span long, with the metaphor, kill the nits and you will have no lice. 
In the 19th century, that slogan re-emerged in both the Australian outback and the American West as a common call to massacre Indians and Aborigines. Nits grow into lice. The Nazis, too, likened Jews to lice, while Al-Qaeda in Iraq today targets Iraq's Shia community as the locus where the disease lies, quote, unquote. The cure and prevention of the crime of genocide must lie at least in part in the diagnosis of its recurring causes and symptoms. Despite all these catastrophes, the 16th century Portuguese Jesuit was wrong. All was not homicide, at or since the beginning of the world, as he put it. Not even in early modern and the modern world. Large historical processes made it more likely but genocide is always the result of decisions made by individuals, usually very few, acting conspiratorially, who think in certain similar ways, discuss them, and set about putting those views into action. Others, and just about every case this is true, others oppose them. Genocide is not inherent in human history, but it is recognizable there. Often, it is detectable in advance. It can be seen coming, and we have to recognize it. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, we have time for questions yeah. or comments. Yes. <clears throat> Right. Um, agrarianism is a kind of ideal uh, response to urbanization. I think when Cato in ancient Rome uh, talked about the farmers being the real Romans, he was complaining about city people and their contamination by uh, promiscuous Greek values and uh, education and, uh, of course, getting out of control. He would complain about uh, women grouping together in large numbers and uh, and trying to have a say in politics. Uh, in, in many ways, agrarianism is, is not so much an idealization of, of a real agricultural community. It's more a reaction against urbanization and modernity. And uh, racism is something quite similar. I see them as philosophically related, uh, that they're both idealist, completely divorced from ma material reality, but of course with the right military power and organisational skill, uh, racism can be forcefully imposed on a community uh, and so can uh, an agrarian romance. And uh, I would add that agrarianism is strengthened by the other factor I mentioned, which is expansionism, that uh, often the uh, expansionist imperative is justified by the idea that the people living there don't conquer the land. But of course it can be not just people who are living there, it can be uh, you know, indigenous people who are pastoralists or hunter-gatherers or real farmers who are both in Australia and in North America. Uh, when Aborigines or uh, Cherokees and others did actually farm quite competitively, uh, it wasn't uh, acknowledged that that's what they were doing they, and they were still uh, deported from their land. In Australia, as late as the 1920s, Aborigines who were farming corn uh, at the mouths of rivers in northern New South Wales were just uh, driven off their, their land. And it was continued to be said that they uh, were not real farmers. Uh, and so that was a agrarianism function, not only as an idealistic partner to racism, but also as a, an excuse for expansionism. Well, I would say that modernism, uh, agrarianism is a reaction to modernity. It, it goes along with it. So the more modernity you have, the more you are likely to have uh, agrarian reaction to it. Uh, and of course, the Nazis needed a massive military machine uh, 
to conquer the territories and exterminate the people that they did. Uh, but if you look at the people who actually implemented the Holocaust, specifically Himmler and the authors of the uh, Generalplan Ost, the General Plan East, who talked about uh, not only massacring six million Jews, uh, but millions of other people and deporting 31 million Slavs and uh, other inhabitants of Eastern Europe. Uh, those people, sure, they, they were uh, the authors of, uh, of modern military uh, uh, purposes, but they also were uh, romantic agrarians, in particular Himmler, I think, the architect of the Holocaust, is the best example of that. There are people back in Berlin, like Speer, for instance, who didn't really represent that so much. And there are others, uh, I think, in, in all of the minds of, the, of these genocide perpetrators, there is a, a continuing tension between uh, the vision of the primeval ethnic pristine past, which is an agrarian society of only of Germans with no Jews, and at the same time the need of modern machinery to implement that. Create a, a tension which is difficult to prise apart ideolo ideologically. I'm just, I wonder if you've seen any of these elements in Kenya today or what your analysis of that situation is. I think what's happening in Kenya at the moment is a tragic case of uh, communal massacres between ethnic groups. Uh, of course, there was a similar event in Bombay, Mumbai, and, uh, and Gujarat in, 19, in 2002, uh, in which uh, Muslims and Hindus, uh, after Muslims supposedly burnt a train, uh, Hindu mobs uh, massacred them. But they did that with a lot of state uh, uh, sponsorship behind the scenes. Uh, and, but I, I think it is possible to have these communal massacres which are more spontaneous. And I think it may be that behind the scenes is, uh, is uh, a, n a number of, uh, a group of political operatives who see benefit to be gained from this communal conflict. And we'll probably know that before too long, but it also may, uh, may result in uh, a more organized uh, genocidal campaign. I think we have to be very watchful in the case of, uh, of Kenya. Uh, there is, the possibility of genocidal massacres happening in, uh, out of spontaneous ethnic resentment, but they usually don't last for a long period of time. Uh, and if they do, it's usually because there were uh, actors conspiring behind the scenes. Yes, in my book, Blood and Soil, I have a chapter on uh, colonial genocides in Africa, and that's one of the main ones. The Herero people were subjected to genocide by German colonists, including the father of uh, Hermann Goering. Heinrich Goering was one of the first German governors of uh, Southwest Africa, the German colony. And others uh, who later played a role in the Holocaust were active in that first decade of the 20th century in the genocide uh, of the Herero and Nama people uh, in the 1907. Mm. I said the first non-colonial genocide. Armenia uh, is usually called the first genocide of the 20th century uh, and is certainly a much larger case than the Herero case, but I think the Herero case is that, that the first genocide of the 20th century. Yes, I think you're quite right. Yeah, I think there's a strong agrarian influence in Mao. Uh, 
originally adopted from a, an even more uh, violent uh, predecessor called Peng Pai in the 1920s who uh, developed this idea of the, uh, of the uh, peasant revolution, the rural revolution in China. Uh, but, but of course there was also the influence of Stalinism which was not at all agrarian and in fact crushed the peasantry uh, under the uh, policy of building up the cities and industrialization. Yeah, I think there were other factors too in the Soviet-Chinese split, including Chinese uh, nationalism uh, and Soviet sort of domination uh, or attempts to dominate uh, the Chinese Communist Party. But I think there's a lot to it that these revolutions went different ways, a much more industrial uh, bias in the, in the Soviet case and uh, at least in the Cultural Revolution a strong uh, romanticization of the rural areas, including driving uh, intellectuals out into the countryside to see what it was like to be uh, a peasant. But of course the main victims of Mao were peasants who starved to death in the Great Leap Forward of the late 1950s. Yeah. One more here at the front. Mm. Yes, I don't know very much about that particular case, the Biafran case, so I probably shouldn't guess at where it might, uh, where it might fit or whether it was a genocide. Of course, we, I haven't talked much today about another crime of extermination, which is also legally enshrined as a crime against humanity. Uh, and it doesn't require as much uh, legal proof. For instance, with uh, extermination, doesn't require proof of the intent to destroy as well as the acts such as killing members of the group which genocide requires. Uh, so th many of the, the cases that uh, border on genocide would be quite clearly extermination. Uh, we are out of time. So Thank you very much. Yeah.